that Cetes was socially maladjusted as an adult cannot be attributed to any simple set of circumstances. The fact that he had not been taught to play in childhood may be considered a definite parental lack of foresight contributing to this maladjustment. However, we must recognize that it is not easy to find playmates or childish games to amuse or interest an adult mind in a young body, the parents of any precocious child will testify to that. William Cetes, as a youngster, had been unwholesomely placed in the public eye by association with his father's psychological fame, which is a fact of record. Out of this probably grew the eventual separation between parents and son when the youth reached adulthood. As long as he lived, the thought of being considered a public spectacle was positive poison to the soul of Bill Seedes. He refused to have his name attached to any of his later writings and turned down offers of large sums from publishers who would not agree to his use of a pen name. He won a successful suit against the New Yorker magazine for placing him in a ridiculous light in the public eye in 1937, in one of their profiles. Sarah Cedes gave a partial explanation for her son's lifelong animosity toward the press. She related that as a child, returning home from school, a couple of newspapermen would descend upon the boy. While one held him, the other would take his picture. As a youth and as a man, Bill Seedes wanted to be left alone to live as an average individual and said so many times. He objected bitterly to the idea of being stamped a genius and treated as a sideshow with the connotation of queerness that he knew to be associated with genius in the uninformed public mind. After his death, one friend of Bill Seedes wrote a letter that appeared in the contributor's column of the Boston Traveler, objecting to the false impressions given in many newspaper obituary accounts. With her permission, I am reprinting it here. People's editor, this is about Bill Seedes, who died Monday. His numerous friends do not like the false newspaper picture of him as a pauper and antisocial recluse. Bill Seedes held a clerical position until two weeks ago. For two weeks, he had received unemployment compensation for the first time in his life. Today he was to start on a new job for which he had already been hired. Bill Seedes paid his way he was no burden on society. Cedes had plenty of loyal friends. All of them found his ideas stimulating and his personality likable. Very few people know as much about the Indian background of our social customs as he did. His manuscript study of it is worthy textbook material and very readable. He knew dozens of stories from Boston's history and told them with relish. He recently submitted a plan for post-war Boston. But William Seedes had one great cause, the right of an individual in this country to follow his chosen way of life. He had never been able to do this for himself, first because his father made him an example for psychological theories, then because the public, through newspaper articles, insisted that he was a genius, abnormal and erratic. Whenever Seedes saw interference by individuals or governments with anyone's life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, he fought it any way he could. He won a long legal fight against a nationally known publication on the ground that it had invaded his privacy. Bill Seedes was a quiet man who enjoyed the normal things of life. His friends respected him and enjoyed his company. I am glad to have been one of his friends. It is quite obvious from this evidence of Bill Seedes' enjoyment of wholesome friendships to his very last days that his genius did not make him the queer, friendless personality that is too often erroneously thought to be characteristic of geniuses. The intellect of William Seedes did not burn out. What the journalists did not report, and perhaps did not know, was that during all the years of his obscure employments, he was writing original treatises on history, government, economics, and political affairs. In a visit to his mother's home, I was permitted to see the contents of a trunk full of original manuscript material that Bill Seedes composed during the time he was supposed to be reluctant to think. And in his obscure mechanical jobs, the adding machines that the newspapers described him as working on in later life were comptometers. Moreover, he would work two of them at a time, one with his left hand and one with his right, using his elbows for the space bar. That's not all. Supplied with a full share of work that was supposed to consume an eight-hour day, he would finish all of it within one hour. If that's an example of burned-out genius, then I'll. Nor was Bill Seedes lacking in a sense of humor. Many pungent witticisms are to be found in his manuscripts. 
in book form, they will draw many a chuckle from the reader when published. This is a characteristic sample, famous author, foreign correspondent, and noted commentator, a fellow with a sponsor. There was no lessening of William Seedy's mental acuity. Helena Seedy's told me that a few years before his death, her brother Bill took an intelligence test with a psychologist. His score was the very highest that had ever been obtained. In terms of IQ, the psychologist related that the figure would be between 250 and 300. Late in life, William Seedy's took general intelligence tests for civil service positions in New York and Boston. His phenomenal ratings are a matter of record. In the interest of scientific truth and the benefits to be derived from its application, I have tried to offer a truer story of an intellectual genius. To mothers of intellectual prodigies, I say, fear not that the youngster's brain power will be dissipated with age. Feed it, and it will grow like that of any precocious musical or artistic genius. True, there are reports of extremely precocious children whose brilliance flared like a torch and burned out before the age of 12 as a result of a brain tumor, which can be diagnosed by a medical specialist. The life of William James Seedy's vividly portrays what psychology teaches about intellectual genius. It is first born and then developed. The prowess appears at an early age. It does not expire any sooner than musical or artistic talent. Mental derangement is not characteristic of genius. Unrealistic publicity in connection with a youthful person of very superior capacity should be avoided. The feeling of being different or queer should be guarded against. The precocious child is neither to be squelched in his thirst for learning nor to be zealously prodded. Allow the child to be the guide of his guardian. To develop normally, a youthful prodigy should have opportunities for wholesome emotional and social contacts with a friendly world. We have seen the necessity for the rational nurture of the intellectual side of life regardless of what the original nature may be.